ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery depicting awesome apocalyptic events. For many, the Bible and its prophecies seem shrouded in mystery. Words like Armageddon and tribulation frighten millions, while others wonder how to avoid the mark of the beast or being left behind when the Lord returns. Can we understand the Bible? Yes. And Jesus holds your key to unlock a future without fear. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents The Prophecy Code with Doug Batchelor. Today's study, Israel's Temple in Prophecy. Good evening, and welcome to another night of Prophecy Code. Uh, my name is John Loma King, and I'd like to personally thank you for taking the time to sit down tonight, get your Bibles, pray, and get ready for an excursion, because tonight, Pastor Batchelor is going to attempt to cover two lessons in one night, God drew the plans and also about the prophecies of Israel. We'd like to invite you tonight to also bow your heads with us as we invite the presence of God to be here with us as well as with you. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing that flows endlessly, for the love that surrounds us even while we were walking in a wrong direction. We thank you so much, Lord, that when we're going in the wrong direction, that a loving God like you allows U-turns. And tonight, Father, your Spirit has come to give us wisdom and understanding and to open to us the wonderful words of life. We pray that you'll be with Pastor Bachelor as he breaks the bread of life, and may our hearts be filled with joy in following you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'd like to invite you to welcome tonight our speaker once again, President, Director, and Speaker of Amazing Facts, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you, John. Good evening, friends. I'm so thankful to see you here. We're going to have our question time now, and I'll invite out Mrs. Batchelor. This is the favorite part of the program for a lot of people, and so let's see what, what came in. Are you ready? Don't know. Okay, here we go. We're going to go anyway. Are there any other cities here on earth besides the New Jerusalem when we return to earth from heaven after the 1,000 years are over? This came from Amara Joan Sims. She's 10 years old, and she lives in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. That's actually a good question. Uh, it tells us in Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem descends to earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Will there be any other cities? I think there'll probably be a lot of uh, country dwellings, but I think the center city on the planet will be the new Jerusalem. And when you look at the size of it, well, we've got a lesson dealing with Revelation 21, so I'm not going to say too much about that, but I think that'll be the primary city. What if Satan realized the error of his ways, had a change of heart, and really repented? Would he be forgiven? I always wonder if people, I get this question every seminar, are people wondering about how forgiving God is, or are they feeling sorry for the devil? <laughs> I, I, I really wonder what the genesis of that is, but um, he will not repent if you have any hope. Sometimes we think if he would just repent, then he'd stop tempting us and everything would be better, Right? He's not going to repent. Satan has done what you call committed the unpardonable sin. But the hy hypothetical question is, if he repented, well, if he genuinely repented, uh, God's forgiveness is greater than anything. And so uh, my, my bets would be more on God's mercy. But I wouldn't, don't be waiting for the devil to repent. Prophecy tells us he's not going to. And I believe God's word never fails. You said at the Sunday meeting you believe that God has something planned for Israel and the Jews. What do you believe he has planned for them? Thanks, Jeannie. Well, I, of course, it's God's will that everybody be saved. Matter of fact, I jotted down one verse. I knew this question was in there. Romans eleven twenty three. 23, speaking of Israel, Paul says, And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, meaning back into the olive tree of truth, for God is able to graft them in again. Well, I believe that God has a special plan for Israel in that there's going to be a revival among the Jews, and many will become believers. Matter of fact, it's happening now. 
about once a year, our family goes to the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, and there's a, an, one of the biggest exhibits, of course, is the exhibit of Israel, and the Jews for Jesus, Jesus and the Messianic uh, Christians is one of the fastest growing groups. But you cannot deny how remarkable it is. What other country in the world, our lesson tonight deals with Israel's temple, so I'm going to take a moment on this. What other country in the world has been conquered, scattered, and yet after 1900 years they remain distinct, have a distinct language, writing, and then get their original territory back again? That didn't happen to any other country. It is so obvious God's working with the Jewish nation uh, that there's something remarkable there. But uh, we'll say more. Keep coming. All right. David is asking, if we will be here on earth during the tribulation, then how do we know what time in the tribulation that we should head for the mountains before the time that Jesus comes with a shout? Good question. Well, it tells us, for instance, in Matthew 24, and I believe it's Luke 21, uh, Matthew says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Luke says, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Um, and there's a parallel between the fall of Jerusalem back in 70 AD and what's going to happen at the end of time when the abomination of desolation, the beast power, begins to surround God's people with laws. I think the, the key for us is when it becomes illegal because of religious political laws for us to practice biblical Christianity, we're going to have to make ourselves scarce. And like Elijah, when Jezebel said, I'm going to get, take your life, he fled into the wilderness, didn't he? And so we're going to have a similar experience. That's happened several times in the history of God's people. So the Lord will tell you when it's time. You'll know. Okay. So yeah, just don't look back like Lot's wife. That's what Jesus warns us. Just so when that day comes, if you left your coat, leave it. And he'll keep you warm. Don't look back. That's right. All right. Pastor Doug, what about baptism? Is it really necessary for salvation? If you have to be baptized to be saved, how do you explain the thief on the cross? And this is from Keith. There'll be a lot of people who are saved that did not get baptized. What about all the people in Old Testament times? Some churches teach that it's impossible for a person to be saved unless they're baptized. Well, what are you going to do with everybody that lived before the time of Christ? A baptism is a public expression that the Lord has mandated where we demonstrate our commitment to Christ. But it doesn't mean that uh, a person can't be saved. Let me give you an example. Sometimes I'll go to the hospital and I'll pray with somebody who is terminally ill. They're hooked up to all of these machines. They want to accept the Lord and I'll lead them to the Lord, but maybe they can't get baptized because of their medical condition. Does the Lord say, well, I'd like to save you, but you didn't get in the water and so I can't save you? No, of course not. Baptism isn't going to be an obstacle. I've been in prisons where people wanted to accept the Lord, but because of the rigid, maybe they're on death row, the rigid rules, they couldn't get baptized. Is that going to be an obstacle? No. I think that anybody who can be baptized that doesn't want to, there's an issue of disobedience. But I think everybody who uh, has an opportunity will naturally want to be baptized. Well, and Jesus was baptized for those who could not. Good point. That's usually Christ your was, point. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned it. That's why you're here. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I meant to share, but... Uh, the Bible tells us Christ didn't die for his sins. He died for ours. Christ was not baptized to wash away his sin, was he? Mm -mm. He was baptized as an example for you and me, and if you will, in behalf of those who cannot be. They can take claim of his baptism, right? All right. I am a Hindu, but I need to become a Christian in order to marry the person that I love. He is a Christian and wants me to learn about it. I strongly believe that I should not get baptized until I know its significance in my life. I'm seeking for help. Please reply. Thanks, Vandana. Well, I would say don't get baptized in order to get married. Your commitment in marriage to Jesus must be genuine. And I have occasionally met people who, in order to accommodate the one they love, they join their church even though they may not really believe what the church believes. That's dishonest. Even if you really love the person, you want to marry him, don't pretend that you're embracing that faith in order to get married. My recommendation would be 
read the Bible, and I would hope that you'll fall in love with the truth in, in Jesus, and then you won't have that conflict anymore, but do it because it's the truth not to get married. Amen? And continue coming to the meetings, and you'll learn That's more, right. and, and That's then right. you'll have an opportunity to make that choice. Amen. All right. We about out of time? I think we're out of time for you know, questions tonight. Thank you so much, friends, for tuning in. And tonight we have a very important presentation that is dealing with the subject of the temple, Israel's temple in prophecy. And I think we're going to learn some very interesting things tonight, uh, some things that you maybe have never heard before, but I want to make you promise what we present is going to come from the Bible. Amen? And so let's just make sure we stick to the Word, and then we'll know that we're safe. I always like to begin with an amazing fact. And uh, some of you maybe have, have heard of Henry Ford's mansion. He renamed it Fairlane. It is uh, an architectural wonder. He was very involved in the designing of this magnificent structure, 32,000 square feet, uh, 13 beautiful fireplaces. One of them, I think, is 13 feet high, made of marble, situated on 1,300 acres right there by the Rouge River in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, uh, a lot of very interesting facets to this uh, uh, geniuses. Henry Ford was a genius in his own right, developed the assembly line, his architectural masterpiece. Among the things, he was uh, an ornithologist. He loved birds, had 500 birdhouses, had a little Santa's workshop for the kids, had a miniature farm for the kids with miniature farming equipment. And... Uh, but one of the things that made it unique was he, he didn't like the exorbitant prices the utility company charged for electricity, so he made his own powerhouse. He diverted some water from the Rouge River and went through these turbines, and he had 500 switches in a panel that would power his uh, massive mansion. The interesting thing was that in 1947, after 30 years of living there, the only time the power failed because the... Uh, Rouge River went on a rampage one spring. Heavy rains killed the boilers that powered the generator, and the electricity went out. And it happened to coincide with the very time that Henry Ford was dying. And he died in the dark with candlelight, no heat, two miles from the place that he had been born 87 years earlier. You know, it makes me think about a similar circumstance in the Bible. When Jesus died on the cross, at the same time that Christ died in the spring, five miles from the place of his birth, a building that he had designed had a power failure. How many of you remember that when Jesus died, what was happening in the sanctuary at the same time? The veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place that represented the presence of God was torn from the top to the bottom by an unseen hand, laying open the vacancy because the ark was not there anymore, and one might declare Ichabod. You ever heard that phrase before? The glory is departed. The significance of what happened when Jesus died in the temple has a very profound impact on God's people and the role of the temple in prophecy. Now, we need to begin with the beginning. There are actually three temples on earth that you read about in the Bible. How many? I want to make sure you're still with me. You've got what they call the Temple of Moses. Then there's the Temple of Solomon. Then there's what they called Herod's Temple, but it was first built by the people in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, but Herod embellished it. When the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, of course, they went through the Red Sea. Instead of going right to the Promised Land, he first brought them to Mount Sinai. Why did he go to Mount Sinai? because he needed to receive the Ten Commandments. But that's not the only thing he received up on the mountain. While he was up on the mountains there, God gave him some divine plans for a sanctuary. And that was one of the principal reasons. Not only did God give him the plans for the sanctuary, they were not allowed to go to the Promised Land till they had built this portable temple. Nothing like it had ever been constructed before, a nation that carried their temple around with them. Whereas in all other cultures, the temple was the center of the nation. Uh, this temple went with the people. 
and the presence of God hovered above the temple. All right, let's get to question number one. What did God ask Moses to build? Answer, he said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. God wants to dwell among his people. Now, in the Bible, it not only tells us that God has a place that's called a sanctuary. Sometimes we call our churches the sanctuary. The Bible says that the church collectively is the temple of God. And furthermore, the Bible says, what don't you know that you are the temple of God? Your body is the temple. And when you're moving around, does God's spirit move around with you? He says, I'll not only be with you, I'll be in you. And so he wanted to help illustrate that. The Spirit of God was present with His people in the form of a cloud and a fire. A cloud during the day that gave them shade, a fire at night, and that was a symbol for the Holy Spirit. Uh, after they came out of Egypt, they had spoiled the Egyptians, and they had a lot of the materials that the Egyptians used. Let me see. Hey, there we go. It's working. Praise the Lord. Thank you. A lot of the materials that the Egyptians had given them, they spoiled the Egyptians, they took gold and cloth, they then dedicated to build this portable tabernacle. And God gave very specific plans to Moses right down to the very underwear that the priests wore. I mean, everything was planned out by the Lord. Matter of fact, the same way that God gave the information to, Moses, uh, to Noah about how to build the ark, God gave also very specific instructions to Moses about how to build the sanctuary. Question number two, what did God expect his people to learn from the sanctuary? Answer, it says in Psalm 77 verse 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And you can understand this to mean that the way that the Lord redeems the way of God in many respects is found in this unusual edifice. Now you might be thinking, Pastor Doug, this is a prophecy code meeting. We expect a special emphasis on prophecy, and we're going to look at a prophecy tonight. But are you aware that many of the Bible prophecies revolve around the sanctuary? Revelation, whole thing practically transpires in the sanctuary. First few chapters, Jesus appears among seven candlesticks. Where do you find that? That was in the first room, the holy place. The vision of Isaiah, chapter 6 in Isaiah, he sees the temple of God with these seraphim on the right and the left of the throne of God, the visions of Ezekiel, part of the visions of Daniel, and many of the other Bible prophets transpire in the context of the sanctuary. So if we don't understand this, matter of fact, I think sanctuary is mentioned, sanctuary, temple, tabernacle, over 300 times in the Bible. It's a subject we need to understand, and yet the average Christian is fairly illiterate on what the meaning of the Hebrew sanctuary is, and it is so important and integral to understanding Bible prophecy because basically this sanctuary is telling us about Jesus. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. It demonstrates how he saves, and it helps us peek into the whole process of salvation. I'll say more about that, and uh, you'll understand better as we proceed. Number three. From what source did Moses obtain the blueprints for the sanctuary? We can read the answer. It tells us in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 40. And God said, And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was shown thee in the holy mount. Furthermore, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, he said, see that thou makest all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. Did Moses sit there on the mountaintop and just dream this up, or did God give him very specific instructions on how to build this? Any of you here ever play with matchbox cars? You know what I'm talking about, the little cars. How many of your kids have them? Our kids have a bucket of matchbox cars. Part of the reason for that is... Um, We've had four boys, and sometimes when you go to the store and they just want something, you can get them for, you know, a dollar. Make them happy. <laughs> now, one reason that they are so enduring is if you get like a little matchbox Mustang, do you know how they develop that? They put more into that than you think. They take a full-size Mustang. They 
get all of the dimensions in a computer. They actually, now they have a process where they have rollers that go right over the dimensions. It's stored three-dimensionally, and then they reduce that down to this little thing. But they are built to scale. Are you aware of that? It's a very interesting fact. The temple that Moses was instructed to build is a very miniature model of God's dwelling place in heaven. But it's not an exact duplicate. For instance, on the temple on earth, there were golden angels on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Does God have golden angels by His throne or real ones? The temple on earth, there were angels carved in the walls of the Holy of Holies. Are there carvings of angels? Are there clouds of angels that surround God in heaven? The one on earth was about 45 feet. The one in heaven, 45 light years. God works on a bigger scale. And so, you know, God had to get things condensed where our little minds could comprehend these things. But be careful not to take these illustrations too far. You need to think in celestial terms. Remember, when we go to heaven, God says, Eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And God himself will be the temple, the Bible says. Question number four. What furniture was in the sanctuary? We're going to look at some of the specifics now. And to begin with, we'll start with the courtyard. Uh, there were three parts to the sanctuary. I can tell you that to start with. There was the courtyard, the holy place, the most holy place. How many main areas? Three. How many parts of salvation? Justification, sanctification, glorification. Hey, we got some scholars out there. You know what the three primary areas of salvation are. The courtyard represents justification. The sanctuary, I'm saying the holy place is sanctification, the holy of holies, and glorification, because the glory of God was there. In the courtyard, there were two primary pieces of furniture. You had the altar of sacrifice. And you can read about that in Exodus 29. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. Then you also had the laver, Exodus 30, verse 18. Thou shalt also make the laver of brass, and thou shalt put water therein. The priests would wash. Um, just store this, and then as we go through, I'm going to stop and, and take it piece by piece and explain it. But we have a friend who developed an animation. John Wood did this for us a few years ago. And it helps you get a little picture of now as we move into the holy place, we're going to look on the screen and we're going to see a little bit more about what's in the next two apartments, known as the holy place and the most holy place. And uh, keep in mind, you're going to now go where only the priests were allowed to go. When you went into the holy place, of course, you had the candlestick on your left with seven candles lamps on it. That appears in Revelation. The altar of incense, and we saw on our right was the table of shewbread. Then you move into the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go once a year. What was in there? The Ark of the Covenant with those beautiful golden angels, and everybody would like to find that golden box. What's the important thing, though? The golden box or what's inside? And what was in the golden box? It was called the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testament because the testimony, the covenant God made with man, meaning the Ten Commandments, was in that golden box. So now let's go back and we'll review on our slides again what was in the first room called the Holy Place. There was a table of showbread. And how many loaves were there? Twelve. One for each of the tribes of Israel. And this is a symbol of the provision of God as they went through the wilderness and it also represents the bread of life, the Bible. Then you also had the candlestick on your left as you went in the main door. That re represents the light. It was kept burning with pure olive oil, a symbol of the Holy Spirit that keeps the fire burning in our hearts, that first love fire. It illuminated the apartment. It's the light of God's Spirit that gives us discernment. And then in the very middle, just before the veil, was the altar of incense. This was the place where the priest would sprinkle incense, the smoke, this pleasant aroma would waft over the curtain into the presence of God, and it's where he made intercession. It represents the prayers of the saints. Now, everything in that room is telling us about the personal devotions of a Christian. There are three things, the bread, the light, the altar of incense. If you want to grow as a Christian, you need to read your Bible, you need to pray, that's the altar of incense, 
the bread, the Word of God, and let your light shine, share your faith. Those are the three primary disciplines of the Christian. And so it's telling us about the plan of salvation. And I'll say more about what's in the courtyard in a minute. But let's move now into the holy place. And you can see this is an artist's concept here of the layout. The veil was separating the holy place from the most holy place. Angels were engraved in the walls. Angels were woven into the fabric of the veil. They were not supposed to look upon the ark or the presence of God. Why? Because we're separated because of sin. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil rent, meaning now we can approach the throne of God boldly through Christ. Amen. And we become a nation of priests because of his sacrifice. So, oh, there's so much here. I wish I had more time to share all this with you. What was in the Holy of Holies, most holy place, was the Ark of the Covenant, this golden box. And in the Ark of the Covenant was what? The Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, and he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments. And again, it says in um, verse 5, I turned and I came down the mountain and I put the tables in the ark which I had made, the golden ark that he had been instructed to build. Now, think about this, friends. Over in the Middle East, there's a place called the Holy Land. What's that country? Israel. And in the land of Israel, the holy land is the holy city. What's that called? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. You know the answer. Stay with me. And in the holy city of Jerusalem, there's the holy mount. Who knows what that's called? Mount Zion or sometimes Mount Moriah. And on the holy mount is the holy temple. And in the holy temple, you've got the holy place. And after you pass through the holy place, you've got the holy of holies. You see, there's, there's like a bullseye that I'm forming for you. The holy land and the holy city, holy mount, holy temple, holy place, holy of holies. And what was in the holy of holies? The holy ark. And what was in the ark? Ah, the temple is golden and marble and the holy place is gold and the ark is gold. And what was in the ark? The focal point of all these holiest of places in the whole planet is two rocks. Isn't that interesting? Well, Jesus is the rock, isn't he? Amen. But these are not any stones. They are inscribed by the finger of God and those words were spoken by the voice of God. And you know what it is? That law is a summary of love. Jesus tells us that all the law is summarized in two commandments. First four commandments deal with love for God. The last six deal with love for man. It's all telling about God's love for us. And so this is all pointing to the presence of God. And it, the rock is a type of Christ, right? All right, question number five. Why did animals need to be sacrificed in the Old Testament sanctuary. You know, I've had a lot of people that have approached me and said, Doug, you know, I love Jesus and the Bible has a lot of wonderful truth, but I am so turned off by the grisly sacrificial system. Why was all that blood necessary? It is an awful thing to consider. Why was it necessary? Answer, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is how much? No remission for sin. There's no forgiveness for sin. And uh, again, we read in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission or the forgiveness of sin. Now, if you lived back in Bible times and you wanted to be forgiven, you would bring your lamb to the temple. And if you were the head of your family, you would place your hands on the head of that little victim and you would confess your sins and the sins of your family. In the Bible times, the patriarch of the family, Job would offer sacrifice for his family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they offered sacrifice for their family. The father in the family, the sheik, the patriarch would offer sacrifice for his family. And he would transfer symbolically the sins of the family, those confessed sins, to this innocent lamb. And then they would cut its throat and catch the blood. And in the temple, the priest would then sprinkle the blood before the Lord, saying, this blood represents the life of this innocent lamb 
that has died for these people. Now think about it. If you wanted forgiveness every week, suppose you did it weekly, you ought to be praying all through the day for if you make a mistake or you sin, you should deal with it right then and there. And at least at the end of the day, right? In case you die in your sleep. And if I die before I wake, how many of you said that prayer at some time growing up? <laughs> I remember Tony, was it, Tony Campola said, don't pray, Lord, if I die before I wake. Say, Lord, wake me up before I die. <laughs> <laughs> but what if you had to take a lamb and cut its throat every time you wanted forgiveness? How many of you would find that extremely disturbing? It'd make it a little harder to sin if you had to go watch this little wiggly, innocent creature with his tail twitching and you had to take its life if you wanted forgiveness. What should bother you more, that concept or the concept that Jesus had to die for your forgiveness? Whenever the Hebrews offered a lamb, it was to remind them that someday God's lamb would come. And that's why it was such a, a shocking thing when John the Baptist pointed to Jesus with his great crowd there and said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He did that more than once. There he is, the Lamb. All those other lambs from Abel to the present point to him. That was a stunning statement for him. But you know what happened to the Jewish nation? The same thing that happens to the church today. They got so used to it. It's like someone that works in a slaughterhouse stops. They don't think about all the animals dying around them anymore. You get callous. Christians can get calloused about sin and how it hurts Jesus. Paul tells us in Hebrews that we can get to the place where we crucify the Son of God afresh and count the blood of the covenant as an unclean thing. God have mercy on us. We get to that place where it doesn't hurt us to think how much our sins hurt Jesus. When it would be harder for us to kill a lamb than to realize the Lamb of God died for our forgiveness and shed His blood. Amen? God wants it to move us. It should move us. Number six. How is the plan of salvation illustrated in the sanctuary? Well, a number of ways. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us. Now, one of the things that happened when Jesus died on the cross and the veil in the earthly temple was torn, it signified that all of the ceremonial laws that had been developed and given to Moses met their fulfillment do we still need to sacrifice lambs for forgiveness? Does the Bible tell us that circumcision is mandatory for people to be saved? No, Paul says circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, keeping the commandments is what matters. And so the idea that, um, you know, we need to keep, sometimes I have dear friends that uh, they try to urge me to keep the Jewish feast days. And I say, why would you want to do that when they were shadows that pointed to the reality of Christ. There's things we can learn from studying the Jewish feast days, but for us to keep them, do we keep the Passover now the way the disciples did? They used to sacrifice lambs. Why would you sacrifice a lamb when the Lamb of God came? You can accept His sacrifice. Amen. You know what I say to people is, it's sort of like a family that has a, a young son or daughter that's in the military, and they're looking at their picture on the mantle, and every now and then they go up and they give their picture a stroke or a kiss. And finally, they come home on furlough, and you see them at the door. You say, oh, it's so glad you're here, and you run back over and hug the picture again. <laughs> Why would you do that? They're there, right? And, but you're going to meet. They'll be Christians, and they're probably well-intentioned that try to say how important it is to keep the Jewish ceremonial laws. I respectfully disagree. My Bible tells me Christ is now our Passover lamb. Amen. Things went through a radical transition. They were all shadows that have now met their fulfillment. Furthermore, Hebrews chapter 4 do I have to go find a Jewish priest to find forgiveness, or do I have Jesus, my high priest? It says, we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is our high priest, and we are all a nation of priests. Amen? We're called the nation of kings and priests. Furthermore, Hebrews chapter uh, 8, verse 1 and 2, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So Jesus is ministering in the real sanctuary of what's the earthly one was just a model. And so the idea of carrying on with an earthly temple now, does the church need that or have things gone through a transition to the heavenly temple? Now, here's what I've been waiting for. This is my favorite part. And uh, you can see an illustration here of the sanctuary. It's very simple. But you can see here 
there's three places in the sanctuary. Um, you've got how many entrances? One. One door. Who is the door? Who, did, who said He was the door? Jesus said verbatim, I am the door. The way to God. Now, you notice the sanctuary is separating the lost from God who is in the Holy of Holies. The presence of God is the most holy place. You and I have been separated from God by sin. The idea of salvation is we are trying to get back to God. I'm real tempted to walk up here to the screen, but I know they hate that in the studio. So you just, you use, I'll try to visually describe this for you as well as I can. When you walk through the door, who's the door? What's the first thing you see? Altar of burnt offering. By the way, you see a little cross down there. Uh, I've had some rabbis tell me they also had a stake driven in the ground that had a little cross piece on it because they would tie the lambs off when they cut their throat to catch the blood. That's interesting, isn't it? You remember in the Bible where it says Jesus made a whip of cords? They used these cords to tie up the sacrificial victims when they uh, caught them. Um, first thing you saw when you went in, oh, by the way, what I just said, that's not in the Bible. That's a, a rabbi shared that with me. Uh, when you walked in, there was the altar. That represents the cross. That's where the sacrifice was laid and burnt. That represents the fiery trials that Jesus went through, the suffering that He went through for you and me. The first step in salvation is what? The cross, the altar. The cross equals what? The altar. The altar equals the cross. Then after you've accepted Jesus, what's the next piece of furniture on your journey to God? The laver. The labor represents baptism, okay? When the children of Israel went out of Egypt, there were three areas the children of Israel went through to get to the promised land. Slaves in Egypt, then the wilderness, and they were justified in Egypt when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, right? That's the courtyard. Then the wilderness is the holy place, then the promised land was the most holy place, when the children of Israel got out of Egypt, what did they go through? Red Sea. Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, they were baptized in the sea. Before we can get out of Egypt and into the wilderness, on our way to the promised land, you've got to go through baptism. The last thing they went past before they went into the holy place was the water, baptism. Cleansing, commitment to Christ is symbolized there. Now you move into the holy place. There's three things in there. You've got a table of shoe bread. Who is the bread? Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He is the bread of life. Then on the left there, you've got the, uh, the uh, candle stand. Who is the light? <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Then there's the altar of incense, which represents the prayers. In whose name do we pray? We pray in the name of Christ. He's everything. Then if you should move into the Holy of Holies, you've got the Ark of the Covenant there. And that golden box represents, what's in the box again? The rock's in the box. Who is the rock? Jesus is. And even the sanctuary, this is so incredible because it, 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 it also even rep represents your body. You know, the Bible says, what, don't you know your body is the temple of God? Um, do our bodies have an altar that's consuming? Yeah, you're always consuming energy all the time. You're burning calories, sometimes more than others. Does our body have a system that cleanses like the labor, the water? Yeah, matter of fact, most of us are 90-something, maybe 85, 90% water. Then there was storage of food in the sanctuary. Do our bodies store food? Yeah. The light, the Bible says, the light of the body is the eye. Was there a light in the sanctuary? Then there's this ethereal altar of incense, a spirit. Does man have a spirit? Even biblically it teaches that, right? Do you know... Scientists, brain surgeons, cannot tell you how a thought is stored. They still don't know if a thought is a physical thing. It's, it's a mystery how the mind works. And then if you go into the Holy of Holies, thy word I have hid in my heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, that's your mind. God doesn't communicate with us through our elbows or our knees or our stomachs. He communicates with us through our minds, doesn't he? And so, it's even a type of the human body. Oh, there's so much I could share with you about this, but I'm running out of time, and I haven't even got to the prophecy for tonight yet, so I need to hurry along here. Um, the next temple we get to, after the tabernacle was brought into the promised land, uh, by the time of King David, David wanted to build a new one. He gathered all of the money and the resources to build Solomon's temple. And the Bible says, 
the temple of Solomon, when it was being built with, with stone, it was finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. It was one of the most beautiful temples in the world, one of the wonders of the world, filled with gold and bronze and silver. Keep in mind, during the time of Solomon, the Bible record is there was so much gold in the country that silver was like stones. I mean, wouldn't you have liked to have seen the land of Solomon when the Queen of Sheba, you ever heard the expression, breathtaking? Do you know that comes from the Bible? When the Queen of Sheba, it says she was breathless when she saw the marvels of Solomon. That became one of our popular sayings. It was the most spectacular temple in the world, one of the wonders of the world back then. But even though it was a beautiful building and the presence of God was in the temple when they dedicated it, over time the people became complacent. Even Solomon set up false gods in the temple eventually. It lasted about 380 years. Finally, King Nebuchadnezzar came along and destroyed the temple in about 586 B.C., Evidently, Jeremiah and some of the priests took the Ark of the Covenant and hid it somewhere around Jerusalem, probably in a cave or an old tomb. We don't know. Nobody's found it yet. Wouldn't it be nice if they found the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments inside? Would you like to find the Ark of the Covenant? Yes. Why? Do you want the golden box or do you want the rocks in the box? Do you know that you've got what's in the Ark of the Covenant in your Bible? Isn't that right? Ten Commandments is in there. I'll tell you what's in the ark right now. You've got it. That's a treasure. Now, when the children of Israel were carried off to Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, they had been instructed by Solomon to pray towards that place. And while Daniel was a captive in Babylon, he on a regular basis would pray towards Jerusalem. In Daniel chapter 9, he's praying towards Jerusalem praying about when the Messiah is going to come and how long until God's people get to go home again. And an angel is sent from heaven to answer his prayer. Now, we're going to look at a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 about when the Messiah came the first time, telling about when the veil in the temple would be torn. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, and I hope you read the supplemental material because I am greatly condensing this presentation. What does the angel Gabriel say in verse 24? Regarding Daniel's people and when the Messiah would come, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for the holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision. In other words, this vision would be completed and to anoint the most holy. How many weeks? 70 weeks. And in that 70-week period of time, a lot of things were going to happen. The sacrifice would cease. The Messiah would be anointed. The Jewish people would complete their primary purpose as a people during that time. Then he says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince... There shall be seven weeks. He begins to divide up the 70 weeks. What does a day equal in prophecy? Who knows? I'll give you more scripture for that in a minute. That first seven weeks. If a day is a year in prophecy, seven weeks has how many days? Seven times seven is 49. 49 days is really 49. It says that for that first seven weeks, the street will be built again and the wall in troublesome times. You can read in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah how during that first 49 years when they returned from Babylon that the streets and the walls of the city was rebuilt and they started building the temple during troublous times. A lot of persecution and opposition. And he said there'd be another three score in two weeks. Who remembers what a score is? If you've been to the Lincoln Memorial, you know. A score is 20, right? Four score would be 80. Three score is 60 and two. So you've got 62 weeks Plus the seven weeks, you got 69 weeks. One week is still missing to make a total of 70. At the end of 69 weeks, the Messiah would be anointed. Now, I'm going to repeat some of these things because sometimes repetition helps us remember. Back to our lesson. Number seven. What event and date were to mark the starting point for the 490-year prophecy? We, we just read there in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. He said, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. 
unto the Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Now, while we're looking at this prophecy of 70 weeks, oh, and by the way, you may hear me go back and forth. How many days in a week? Seven. 70 weeks is 70 times seven is how many? 490 days. And a day equals a year in prophecy. So how many years is that? This prophecy is 490 years. Any of you remember when Peter said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? And what did Jesus say? Seventy times seven. That should have clicked in their minds because that goes right back to the prophecy of Daniel, doesn't it? God was going to give the Jewish nation not another 70, 490 days of forgiveness. He was going to give them another 490 years to complete their mission. Okay? Oh, by the way, what was the primary mission of the Jewish nation? Did God pick the Jewish nation because He liked their DNA more than other races? Or did God say that through Abraham, the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed? They were to, the Messiah was to come through them, and they were to introduce and proclaim the coming of the Messiah. That was the primary purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's why God called the Jewish nation. It wasn't so they could be exclusive. It was so they could introduce the Messiah to the world, and they did. I'll get to that in just a minute. Unto the Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Okay, now let's look quickly some biblical support for the principle of a day equals a year. You might jot these down, Ezekiel 4, 6. Yeah, I have appointed thee each day for a year, Numbers 14, 23, each day for a year. You can even look at a prophecy in the New Testament where some adversaries came to Jesus and they said, you know, King Herod is trying to get you, and he's going to do to you what he did to John. I'm paraphrasing, but this is exactly what Jesus said. He said, go tell that fox, behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today, tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Jesus said this about six months into his ministry. Did Jesus preach three more days or three more years? Three more years. Even Christ utilized this principle of a day equals a year in a prophecy, okay? So the decree to restore and build Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes. Why don't you say that with me? Artaxerxes in 457 B.C. It's one of the most clearly established dates in the Bible. You can even find the decree in your Bible, Ezra chapter 7, verse 7. Look it up for yourself. If you go... 490 years from 457 B.C., that comes to 34 A.D. What happened then? Stay with me. Let's go back. Question number eight. Was the Messiah anointed 69 prophetic weeks or 483 literal years after 457 B.C., as the angel said? And remember it said that in order to anoint the Messiah, there would be first seven weeks, then 62 weeks for a total of 69 weeks to anoint the most holy. Who is the most holy? Christ. What happened in 27 AD? Jesus was baptized. Does that mean He was anointed? When did Christ begin His ministry? At His baptism. Did Jesus perform any miracles before His baptism? No. No record. He taught in the temple when He was 12 years old, but no miracles. He actually asked questions during that time. He began His public ministry in 27 AD when he was 30 years of age, old enough to serve as a priest. Moving right along, it says here in Acts chapter 10, verse 37, the word that I know after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. He was anointed. Remember when he came up out of the water, what happened? Holy Spirit came down. He began, it says he was tempted by the devil, and then he began preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Isn't that interesting? Exactly 69 weeks after the decree to restore and build Jerusalem, Jesus began His ministry. There's still one more week to go. By the way, I almost hate to tell you this, but how many of you, you've heard of the seven years of tribulation? You know where they get that seven years of tribulation? From this prophecy. They take the last week of this prophecy, they pull it off, and they have it floating down around at the end of time. I don't think that's good biblical scholarship to do it that way. The Bible gives it as one complete, concise whole. What good is a time prophecy if you break off the last seven years and move it? How can it be part of the first 69 weeks? Anyway, I think it's all connected, and you see if you don't agree. Number nine, 
What was to happen in the final week of the 70-week prophecy? Answer, it tells you in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Who was the Messiah cut off for? He was cut off for me and for you. Now, how long did Jesus teach? Jesus taught for three and a half years. You know how many three and a halfs there are in the Bible? There's several. Don't miss the number three and a half. In a Jewish year, there are 360 days. The Jews used a lunar calendar. In some ways, it's more accurate than ours. We have to add leap year. They used to add a month every few years. Um, 360 days in a Jewish year. Three and a half years is 1,260 days. You know, that number appears in Revelation several times. Matter of fact, in the book of Daniel, it talks about a time, a times, and half a time. Several times. That represents three and a half years. There was a famine in the days of Elijah where he fled into the wilderness. How long was that famine? Three and a half years. Now, we've told you that numbers represent something in the Bible. Matter of fact, at our website, prophecycode.com, not only can you download some of the Bible symbols and their prophetic interpretation, we've also got a basic list of Bible numbers, like the ni- number 7 and the number 40 and the number 12 and the number 70 and a number of the, a number of the numbers that uh, frequently appear in what their meaning is. What does the number 7 represent? A perfect, complete cycle. Three and a half is half or an interruption of seven. My study leads me to believe that three and a half in the Bible represents a time of rejection and persecution. Did Elijah have to run for his life after that three and a half years of famine? Was he persecuted? Was Jesus persecuted after three and a half years? Three and a half years after Christ died, the first Christian martyr died. What was his name? Stephen. Stephen. Uh, the, The... Jewish Supreme Court condemned him, and he was executed. And then when you get to Revelation, it says the woman fled into the wilderness during a time of persecution for 1,260 days, three and a half years, 42 months, a time, a time, and the dividing of times. That number is so important that the Bible gives it to us three different ways so we won't miss three and a half. It's called three and a half years, time at a time, a time, a times, which is a couple, and the dividing of time, three and a half. 42 months, 30 days in a Jewish month, or 1,260 days. Very interesting time period. Christ preached three and a half years in person, and then, of course, He was crucified. Now, someone might be wondering, how was it possible for this last three and a half years to be fulfilled? Go back. Do you have your Bibles? Any of you bring your Bibles here? I hope you did. And those of you who are watching at home... Go to Daniel chapter 9, back to our prophecy again, and it tells us that, um, verse 27, then he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, who is it that is confirming the covenant with many for one week? This is something you've got to get right, friends, because I'm just going to tell you right now, there are a number of Christians, and I don't question their Christianity, they believe the one confirming the covenant is the Antichrist. If you have read the Left Behind books, Hal Lindsey, I don't mean to be too specific, but I guess I am being, they believe the one who confirms the covenant is the Antichrist. I'm telling you, it's the Messiah, Jesus. We better get this right. You better find out for yourself. You study it, you find out what makes more sense. Let's just read it together here. As a matter of fact, we're going to back up again. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, what is the subject of this great prophecy? When is the Messiah coming? The Prince. Isn't that Jesus we're talking about? This is the subject. There'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And the street will be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Then after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus was baptized in 27 AD. 
He was cut off three and a half years later in the midst of that last week. And the people of the prince who are to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is the verse that confuses many people. The people of the prince who is going to come, you notice the word prince there in your Bible, is that a capital P or a small P? That's talking about the persecuting powers, the Roman powers destroyed the sanctuary, they destroyed the temple. And it's just giving you the overview. Now, here's where I've just got to stop and explain something. If you want to understand Bible prophecy, this is a key I'm giving you right now. The Bible writers were Jewish, with the exception of Luke and a little bit written by Nebuchadnezzar and a decree by Darius. 99% is written by Jews. How people can be anti-Semitic and claim to be Christian, I don't know, because they're reading a Jewish book and using it to hate Jews. That doesn't make any sense to me. You know, when uh, Mel Gibson came out with this movie on the Messiah, they gave him such a hard time about being anti-Semitic. Did you, some of you hear that? And my mother was a film critic, and some of these people that were criticizing were some of my Jewish friends that were criticizing the anti-Semitism, and I wanted to say, I don't get it. The hero is a Jew. <laughs> How can it be an anti-Semitic movie? The hero is a Jew. In any event, I don't want to go there. But when you think like a Jew, they think like newspapers. They write like newspapers. Headlines give you an overview. Then they back up and they give you the fine print. They don't think or talk chronologically. A matter of fact, if you sit in a room of Jews that know each other, and I'm including myself, I'm just telling you about my Jewish family, they all talk at the same time. <laughs> and they understand what everybody in the room is saying. And conversing is something that you do collectively. And it is not uncommon for them to say, for instance, the Messiah will be cut off, not for himself, and the Romans that are going to come, they'll destroy the city. But now back to the Messiah. Genesis. People get confused. It tells about the creation of the world the first six days, right? Chapter 1. Then it backs up and tells how Adam names the animals. And Eve isn't created yet. Is that the eighth day? Did God create her? Wait a second. It says she was created by the end of chapter 1. How come it's backing up and telling how she's created? This is how the Bible is written. Many prophecies are written that way, where it lays out the big picture, backs up, gives you some details, then it moves on. Gives you some details, then it moves on. Did you get that? Amen. This is how the Bible is written. If you think that the prophecies are written chronologically, you're going to get some very convoluted interpretations. And believe me, there's plenty of them out there. All that the angel is doing is he's backing up and telling Daniel, the prince that's going to come is going to destroy the city. But now we're going back to the hero, the Messiah. And he goes on to say, he will confirm, I'm in verse 27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, if you're going to convince me that it's the Antichrist that is confirming the covenant, then you've got something you've got to do. Show me one place in the Bible where the Antichrist makes a covenant. Where does the Antichrist ever make a covenant with anybody? Does the Lord make a covenant with His people in the Bible? Yes, He does. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week, and it says in the midst of the week, He will cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. He'll bring the sacrifice to an end. If you go 69 weeks from the time when... Uh, the command was given to restore and build Jerusalem until Jesus' baptism. That's 483 years. As a matter of fact, um, put that chart up there for me. See that? 483 years from the time of the command being given until the baptism of Jesus, 27 A.D., right on time, Jesus is baptized, right? Then he preaches for three and a half years. You're entering the last week of that whole 490-year prophecy. It's all together, friends. You're entering that last week. In the middle of the last week, Jesus dies on the cross. What happens at the same time he dies on the cross in the temple? The veil is rent. You know what happened to the sacrifice that day? They're getting ready to offer the Passover sacrifice and kill this Passover lamb. And a lot of the religious leaders were oblivious that the real Passover lamb was dying outside the city at the same moment. And Jesus made the sacrifice cease. That Passover, they did not have a sacrifice. They were horrified. The earthquake from the, when Jesus died, there was a massive earthquake, and the veil rent in the temple, and the graves were opened up. It completely disrupted the sacrificial system on that Passover. And ultimately, the temple was destroyed. 
Three and a half years later, he dies right in the midst of the week. Christ confirmed the covenant for a whole week, but he dies in the middle. How could he confirm the covenant for the whole week and then not be there? Um, all right. First of all, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 14. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. Question number 10. Jesus instructed his disciples when they began preaching to go to what group? When he first began his ministry, he didn't say go to all the world and preach to the Gentiles. He said the opposite. He said, I am first to confirm the covenant with my people. I have a covenant with Abraham and his descendants, and I am to confirm that covenant. He said to the disciples, go not in the way of the Gentiles. Go what? Not in the way of the Gentiles. But go rather to who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Another time, a Canaanite woman came to him and said, can you heal my daughter? And he said to her, it sounded a little abrupt, he said, I'm not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He did heal her daughter, but he let her know, this is a side trip. Uh, my mission is really to the seed of Abraham. And he kept that. He never ministered outside of the borders of Israel, did he? You read these goofy books that Jesus went to study in India and he went to uh, do these other things. No, he ministered to his people. He confirmed the covenant that he had made. Jesus is the one who made the covenant with Abraham. Amen? He's the one who gave the plans for the sanctuary to, to a Moses. All things that were made were made by him. Now, at the, at the beginning of his ministry, when Christ started preaching, um, he preached exclusively to the Jews, but he warned them, if you do not embrace this, you're at risk. He says in Matthew chapter 21, verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Well, during the time of Christ, of course, there was Herod's temple, and it was another beautiful edifice. One of the first things Jesus did when he began his ministry, how many of you remember when he chased out all the money changers? He cleansed the sanctuary. And when he did that, he said something, and don't miss these little words. He said, take these things hence, my father's house is not to be a house of merchandise. Whose house? My, my father's house. Amen. My father's house. Amen. Now notice what he said at the end of his ministry. After his preaching was rejected, he said, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Then he goes out and he dies and the veil rips. See what's happening here? This is very important, friends. His disciples come to show him the buildings of the temple. We talked about this already. And say, isn't it a beautiful building? And Jesus said to them, don't you see these things? The day is coming when there's not going to be, I'm rushing ahead here, sorry, there won't be left here one stone upon another that will be thrown down. The significance of this earthly temple is not what it's all about anymore. A matter of fact, Christ said explicitly, he said, destroy this body and in three days I'll raise it up. What was he talking about? Destroy this temple. The church is the body of Christ now. When he died on the cross, the physical temple met its fulfillment. Now it's the body of Christ. This is the temple, right? Even at the trial of Christ, the only thing that they could get to agree on, they found two false witnesses that almost got it right. They heard him say, I'll destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I'll build another one made without hands. He did say something very close to that, didn't he? Because that temple was going to meet its fulfillment and it was no longer necessary anymore. It was all talking about when you're a kid, you play with matchbox cars. When you get to be 18 years old, if your father gives you a matchbox, it doesn't work anymore. That's not going to make you happy. You want the real thing. Why would we be satisfied with this earthly ritual in this temple when we've got the Lamb of God and we've got the temple of the church? the real body of Christ. And yet there are people who are so worked up about wonder when they're going to build the temple again so the Messiah can come back. He already did it. He said, destroy this temple and I'll raise up the one that really matters, my body. Number 11, since Jesus died in the midst of this final week, how did he confirm the covenant with many for one week? Remember it says he'd confirmed the covenant for one week, seven years. He died after three and a half years. What about that last three and a half years? How did he do that? You read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. This is a great verse. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, 
which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was, say this with me, was confirmed, the very word in Daniel, confirmed to us by those who heard Him. In other words, Jesus then confirmed the covenant to the Jewish nation for another three and a half years through the apostles. How many of you know that when Christ ascended to heaven, they did not go to the Gentiles until after the stoning of Stephen, three and a half years later? When the Jewish nation, it says they taught in the temple daily. Jesus says, begin preaching first Jerusalem, Judea, then Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But for another three and a half years, they preached exclusively to the Jews. Pentecost, 2,000 are baptized. 3,000 rather. How, who were they? Gentiles? There were devout Jews out of every nation under heaven dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews. 5,000 baptized in Acts chapter 5. Who were they? Jews. It's not until you get to the stoning of Stephen that things change. Question number 12. When did the 70-week prophecy or 490-year prophecy conclude? If you read in your Bibles, turn with me quickly to Acts chapter 7. I'm looking at the clock, and I'm looking at all I've got to share, and I think I might be able to squeeze this in. Of course, I thought that last night, and I ran out of time. Acts chapter 7, Stephen is brought before the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, by the way, I read an Israeli news release online that January 20th, the um, Jewish nation had a meeting. They're trying to reassemble the Sanhedrin again for the first time in uh, 1,600 years. Isn't that interesting? To discuss again, because they, they think it's the Sanhedrin that must endorse the Messiah whenever He comes, and they believe He's coming soon. And I think a lot of people are getting ready also to accept a counterfeit, so we've got to know what the true is. Amen? Stephen makes his defense. He preaches this spirit-filled sermon, so his face is glowing before the Supreme Court of the nation. And the Bible says that, um, verse 54, when they heard these things, Acts chapter 7, 54, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. What does it mean when the supreme court of a nation, the religious leaders, plug their ears after hearing the gospel from somebody whose face is glowing? That was not a good sign. And I know it is politically incorrect to say this, and I might get some letters from my Jewish friends, but it's the truth. That as a nation, any Jew can be saved, right? There's no hope for me otherwise. But as a nation, they blew it right then. That's, there's no way you can mince words about this. The Messiah came. And what did Peter say? You've crucified the Lord of glory. At least some of them had the wits to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted. But these were convicted and they plugged their ears and they gnashed their teeth. They took him out and they stoned him. And when they stoned him, you know what he did? He said the same thing that Jesus said. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Stephen died very much like Jesus died, a, a bad trial, illegal trial, taken outside the city, killed by his own, and prays for their forgiveness. Three and a half years after Christ begins his ministry, he confirms a covenant in person. Then for another three and a half years, he confirms a covenant through those who heard him, the disciples. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, he told the disciples, so send I you. You go and preach to them now. Preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I believe God has a special work for the Jews. I think you're going to see a revival among the Jews that respond to this kind of preaching the same way they did to the preaching of Peter and Stephen. Many were converted back then as a result of that. When was Stephen stoned? 34 AD. And you know what's amazing? They laid their clothes down at the feet of someone named what? Saul, who later was known as Paul. He's converted in the next chapter, and he becomes the apostle to who? The Gentiles. 34 A.D., something significant happened. The Jewish nation, that 490 years was up for them. That's why Paul said, seeing that you put these things from you, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now the gospel was to go to anybody, Jew and Gentile. The Jews are not restricted from the gospel, but it was not to be exclusively for them anymore. It was now to go to whosoever will. And who is Israel today? So here you've got the prophecy very quickly. 483 years, Jesus is baptized, 27 A.D. 
Then 31 AD, he dies on the cross. He confirms a covenant for three and a half years in person. In the midst of the week, he makes the sacrifice cease. He preaches three and a half years through those he fills with his spirit. The same way he wants to do it with us now. Then Stephen is stoned. The nation officially plugs their ears. The gospel explodes to the Gentiles after that. Number 13, who are God's people and where is his temple today? Answer, the Bible says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, you can read in Romans chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. Nor are they children because they are of the seed of Abraham, that is, those who are of the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. If you've accepted the promise of Jesus, you become the seed. And again, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, Paul says, but who is a Jew? Who is one inwardly. So if you've accepted Christ, shalom. You are a brother and sister of mine, right? You become spiritual Jews. Again, Peter says, you are also living stones. We become the temple of God. Everybody, Jew, Greek, Gentile, male, female, we all are built up to a royal temple. Where's the temple now? Christ's body, his church, is the temple of God today. Now, you might be wondering, what about the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God? Keep coming. We've got a lesson on the Antichrist, and I'll talk about what that means. Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., from that day to this day, the Jews have not had a sacrificial system. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because he made the sacrifice cease. Jesus was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. Friends, and he did that for you. He has a special plan for you. He's wanting you to know these things. All that has happened in the Bible has happened right on schedule. And don't miss this. If Christ came, according to the 490-year prophecy, he came right on time the first time baptized in 27 AD, will he come right on time the second time? Amen. Now wait until we get to some more of these prophecies, friends. The Bible fits together perfectly. He's brought you here because he wants you to know these things. He wants you to be ready. Do you want to be ready? Yes. Let's ask him to help us right now. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for the truth that your people become your temple. We can be living stones and that our very bodies can be your dwelling place, that we individually can become temples. Please fill us with that Shekinah spirit. Help us to be led and ultimately we want to be in the kingdom where you yourself are there and there's no physical temple because your presence is with us. We want to be with you, Lord. Bring these people, bless them in their families, bless them in their spirits, help them to experience forgiveness and eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As humans, we all have addictions to sin. We're weak and unable to resist temptation. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been working to destroy our happiness and drown out the voice of God with those soul-destroying addictions. Apart from God, we are powerless to resist evil. But by God's grace and power, we can experience true freedom from sin. Today's free offer, Tips for Resisting Temptation, covers 12 practical steps to have real power in your life today. You won't want to miss this practical guide for victorious living. Order online at amazingfacts.tv. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S. and its territories. Or call 1-866-708-PROPHECY. That's 1-866-708-7767. Ask for the free offer number 708 when you call. Or write to us at Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Don't resist the temptation to order this book. The entire Prophecy Code seminar is available on DVD, VHS, CD, and audio cassette. Please ask for the respective offer number listed on the screen that matches the format you desire. To order, call 1-866-708-PROPHECY or 1-866-708-7767. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S., or its territories. Or write to Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. The future is now. Share it with a friend.